We were at this point last week of talking about the uh, translation be changes between the New American Standard Bible and the New American Standard Update. Did someone have a question? Yes, sir. Um, Charles Byron, in the um, syntactical analysis section of, your, uh, of the study notes, um, for each of the sections you have on different elements of, of Hebrew, um, you have a whole series of references from other grammars. Yes. Are they in a particular order? In other words, is no. They, no, they're not. No. Okay. Okay. So just take that as just information. They're not ordered in priority or anything of that nature. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the, the reading that we did for today, there was comment about Genesis three fifteen. Yes. I was wondering if you could. Uh, ask we'll be getting to that. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Good. Well, let's go back where we left off. We were talking about Bible translation, and we're going to finish up on that and transition into syntactical analysis, and help prepare you for paper number one which is the biggest paper you'll do in here, will take the most time, and we spend the most time in class working on, as well as the most time in preparing for. But before we get there, let's go back to the translation for a few minutes and talk about translation. You've received back Genesis 3, 1 through 7. I trust that you went over those comments that I gave you, that you went over the handouts I provided you, that gave you my translation with annotations and footnotes to explain the translation, as well as the comments that uh, went through and explained what translations are acceptable and what translations aren't acceptable and why. Uh, I gave you lots of material there to help you as you move forward. Now you've submitted chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. So that means tonight I will be posting on the uh, course page under the uh, course documents the translation uh, that I have of Genesis 3 8 through 16 and a section of comments again so that you can have those to look over but I'm going to talk to you a little bit more now about some technical difficulties you might be having you know Josh had technical difficulties with his cart and the projector this morning took a little while to get it going and working and you may feel the same way in your translation and as he was frustrated with the equipment not working properly so you may be frustrated with your translation not working properly how do you improve that well there's some simple rules number one remember the rules for the gutturals remember that from Hebrew 1 and Hebrew 2 in Hebrew grammar what are the three rules of the gutturals gutturals what are never, never doubled, always take A-class vowels, and what else? Okay. So as you're looking at those rules, keep them in mind. It will help you to identify the reason there are certain behaviors. If you have a tere under a prefixed yod that is very clearly on an imperfect, and you have a comets under the first root letter, and you say, but wait a minute, the nifal triangle isn't there because the nifal triangle is an I-class vowel, hirik, plus a dogish in the first root letter with a comets underneath, and there's no dogish. Take a look at the letter. Is the letter a guttural that rejects doubling? That explains also why the hirik has changed to a tsare. It is heightened to compensate for that rejected doubling. Those type of things you can watch for and learn as you're going along in translation. Perhaps you looked up a word and you say, I, I can't find it. I, I can only see two root letters. Well, stop and think about that as well. Is it a guttural that has dropped off uh, of the end of it? A hay or an olive? The forms of personal pronouns. If you don't remember what your personal pronouns are, third person masculine singular is who, third feminine singular is he, ata is second masculine singular, at is second feminine singular, nachnu or anachnu is first common plural, anoki or ani is first common singular. If you know the personal pronouns, keep in mind that the perfect forms of the verb take the same endings as the personal pronouns. So if you learn those and know them, you can automatically identify the person, gender, and number of the perfect verbs that you face. You can see them there and you can work with them. The names of verb stems. 
Uh, if you can pronounce the name of the verb stem, you know what the form is other than the cow. Because you take a verb like shamer, uh, he kept, and you say cal, cal perfect, it doesn't show up with the name. But you move to the pial, shimer, pial, shimer. Notice the sound? It's the same. Pual, shumer, pual, shumer. Hifil, hishmir, hofal, hashmar. You see, the, the, if you know the name, you've got the game. You know the name, you know then the stem. The hithpael, hithshamer, hithpael, hithshamer. The sound is the same. If you can pronounce the perfect verb and you can identify the ending because you know the personal pronouns, you've got it identified. It all changes when you go to the imperfect because the rules change. But keep those in mind. The verb prefixes and suffixes, learn them. On the imperfects, remember what happens with the imperfects. The cal is a simple verb stem. What's the vowel in the English word simple? Anyone? I, S-I-M-P-L-E. The E on the end is silent, so ignore it. And I, what is the class of vowel under the prefix of the simple verb stem? I class, absolutely. Move to the causatives. What's the first vowel in the English word causative? A. What is the vowel under the imperfect prefixes on causative verbs? An A. A pathak, if it is hifil, because you'll have ya, yashmir, you see, that pathak under there. Or if it's ha vowel, it is a comet, it's an A-class vowel. So causative verb forms in the imperfects have A-class vowels under their prefixes. Simple verb forms like cal and nifal have the I-class vowel. And then you have the pl and pual that take a schwa under the prefix. And then you have the hithpael, which in the imperfect takes a yod or an aleph or a noon, but or a tau, but it also takes an extra tau in there because it's hith pael. I want to introduce you to uh, Joe Charnas. Joe, say hi. And his little daughter, Yael. Joe is a, an Orthodox uh, lay rabbi, and uh, he has often attended our classes. He just came back into town. His uh, wife has been deployed overseas, and uh, he's come back in and is going to visit a few times and so he warned me ahead that he would be in class today possibly and I want to introduce you many of you in here have not yet met him many of those older students have met him uh, he's been around here for a number of years so if you get a chance to talk with him later feel free to uh, and uh, by the way Joe all this is being recorded for posterity on DVD just to let you know well, yes <laughs> I warned the students already you see <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So if you learn the verb prefixes and suffixes, you'll also improve your translation quality because you will improve the, your, your identification of the verb forms. You'll have proper parsing. Your noun prefixes and suffixes. Uh, some of you in translating, for example, ignored a feminine plural ending on a noun. It ended in oath and you translate it as a singular noun. Watch out for that. The masculine plural is im, the feminine plural is op. Uh, pay attention to those things. Uh, the particles. Particles are very important. We saw that in Genesis chapter 3 there in translation, where some of you ignored the particle, a double particle, af ki, in which you had to translate that. Did God really say? The af is an emphatic particle. The ki follows along with it and you need to pay attention to particles, translate them properly. Uh, don't ignore the translation of a particle. There was a gam that was down further in the verses uh, that you need to pay attention to in verse six. Uh, and you need to pay attention to the word order and make certain you place it with the proper thing. Now let's take a look at a couple of examples. If you have a wow conjunction plus a noun, do you translate as then? No, you do not. Because a wow plus a noun or plus a non-verb is a disjunctive clause. 
and there is no such thing as sequential action involved in that. So then does not apply. Instead, you must translate it either, either and or but. You translate it but if there is a contrast. Now let's take another situation. Let's say you have the verb in the, in the katal here, and you have a wekatal verb form, a wow on a perfect. Do you translate it? Is it a wow consecutive? No, it is not a wow consecutive. This is a wow correlative. The wow consecutive is wayik tol. Wayik tol normally expresses sequential relationships. Not always, keep in mind. There are many uses of wayik tol, but the sequential use of narrative dominates. But the wow on a perfect verb dominates not in narrative, but in prophetic literature especially. And there, the relationship of the verbs that have this prefix are logical, not temporal. They might be temporal, but it's not the focus or emphasis. The focus is on the logical relationship. Remember, if you have prophecy and you're talking about future events, they have not yet occurred, and their interrelationships are fuzzy. We don't understand all of them. We can't mark an exact sequence of events. And therefore, they only have a logical relationship. And that's why this form of the verb is being used. Uh, I know that some of you had Dr. Murphy. And Dr. Murphy has already decided that he's going to plague me. He's going to put a thorn in my side. <laughs> he's warned me in advance that he has already washed your brains and put them back in your heads with the thought that any time you see a wow on a non-verb that you could translate it now. Now, in actuality, in English logic and in speech, we use now as a logical particle at times. But when you're doing translation and when you have the task of trying to communicate the word of God clearly in English, when you're translating it from the Hebrew, when you read something that says now, your people in the pew are going to be hearing the word now that is temporal. Unless you have to stop and explain. I do not want you to have a translation that you have to stop and explain. Make it clear from the start. Reserve the word now on for those situations in which it only means right now, at the present time, presently, today, or any such form. Keep that clear. I'm talking about this translationally and communication-wise to keep things clear. In spite of the fact that technically now can be used for the wow on a non-verb, don't use it for my translations. If used on my translations, it will receive an I under it, which means there's a point taken off for inaccuracy because it is not clear. All right? So please watch that and be careful of that. Not now. Atta is the word that is translated as now. But be careful of that because wet atta often means the same as lakain, therefore, and now means therefore. So be careful with that as well. Watch context and work for clarity. Let's take another example. Perhaps you've seen this in your translation, a lamed preposition plus a third masculine singular pronominal suffix. Yes, that is a suffix. And that's a suffix you need to pay attention to in translation. A number of you missed points because you did not translate pronominal suffixes. You skipped them. Just went right over the top. Ignored them. Don't ignore them. This one is not to be translated as not because even though it sounds the same, it is not not. All right? It is to or for him. And there again, remember, the Lamed preposition has about 27 different uses and meanings. There are times when it will mean by context against there are times when it will mean belonging to. There are times when it means to as far as direction. There are times when it means for as, lo as far as benefit or advantage. Uh, there are times when it can even mean opposite. There are many different uses. It can be instrumental. It can be translated as by or through. Watch out for this. Use your lexicon and note the variety of usages. Pay attention to context when you're translating. 
Let's take another example. Remember not is low, same sound as the previous low, but it has an olive, an olive. Not an olive, an olive. All right? And something you need to remember about low is it is what we call the objective negative as opposed to the subjective negative. The objective negative is found like in the Ten Commandments. It means, in essence, never, not at all. Whereas al, aleph, lamed, with a patak under the aleph, can have a more temporary or temporal reference, and it can mean, for example, do not be afraid, maybe with al, al tirei, but when you look at it in the context, you find out it has the idea of don't be afraid in this particular circumstance, or don't be afraid at this particular time, but there will be a time to be afraid. Okay? So watch that carefully as you translate. Then let's take a look at where, what appears to be a, an inconsistency in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where we have Ruach Elohim Ra'ah. And you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's the Spirit of God is evil. If you look at it directly as following normal Hebrew grammar rules, right? And some of you are looking at the makaf and you're thinking, Ruach has to be in the construct state with Elohim, so you're translating it as the Spirit of God. But remember, makaf does not mean that you have a construct state. Makaf only ties two words, any two words together, to indicate that they are to be pronounced as one word. Remember, nouns are in construct state. Only nouns. You can't, have, you can't have verbs in construct except for a participle. Behaving as a noun can be in construct. Adverbs are not in construct. All right? You have a number of different word categories that cannot be in construct. So don't interpret makaf as being a construct. You'll start identifying words in construct that cannot and are never in construct. The makaf is not a sign of the construct state. Delete that concept from your mind. In elementary Hebrew, sometimes you get that because of the fact that so many nouns tied together in the construct have a makaf between them. But they are a small number of makafs that are related to that in the entire Old Testament as opposed to other situations. So do not interpret it that way. This is not the construct state. It's tied together to be pronounced as one word. That's it, period. Then look at the adjective, ra'ah. It is a feminine singular. Well, obviously that does not modify Elohim. Elohim is a masculine plural. When it's speaking of the God, capital G, then the adjective is normally a masculine singular. If it's talking about gods with a little g, plural, then the adjective will agree both in gender and number. It'll be masculine plural. So why is this feminine? It's because ruach is a feminine noun. So this adjective goes with ruach. And the concept here is it is an evil spirit and then from God is understood. An evil spirit from God. A wicked spirit from God that God has sent to plague Solomon. And so as you look at it, the evil spirit of God is not of. Not the. There's no the there. Ra'ah, remember, adjectives agree with their nouns in definiteness as well as gender and number. So if ra'ah is tied to ruach as a definite noun, then ruach would have to be definite, and then you'd have the ra'ah would have to have the article. It doesn't have the article. So these tell us it's an evil spirit from God. Notice the clues. The clues are basic and simple to first year Hebrew. First of all, number one, a makaf does not indicate a construct state in every occurrence. Number two, an adjective agrees with the noun it modifies in definiteness, in gender, and in number. Those two facts, very simple and basic, will lead you to a right conclusion about how to translate this seemingly difficult and unusual phraseology. But you have to think. You have to think. Think about it. Joe, you have a comment. 
is it beyond this class to analyze why it's not phrased more clearly? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you for asking first. Yes, it is. We're at the beginning of exegesis here. So that might be fitting next semester though. You want to be back next semester? Okay. We'll look forward to it. All right. Now let's take a look at another situation. You're familiar with this from Genesis 3 where we have wa yomer, wa yomer, wa yomer, wa yishlach. You can get this in a number of different places. You can have it in not just Genesis 3. You can have it in Genesis 2. You can have it in uh, Genesis 1. You can have it anywhere where we have narrative. All these wa told verbs. So how do we translate them? Do we translate it and he said, and he said, and he said, and he sent? Aaron shook his head with the right answer. No, we do not. Instead, we look at the context and we try to get the flow and the flavor, keeping in mind the Wayiktol verbs are normally sequential. Watch out for when they aren't. Be sensitive to context. And then look and ask the question, is this a temporal sequence, a logical sequence, or is it a situation where perhaps I don't even translate the wow? where maybe it's beginning a new section, or perhaps in translating the verb, I can translate it in such a way that it shows sequence without having to translate the conjunction. Then he said, so he replied. He said, therefore he sent. Keep these options in mind as you're looking at the text and translate. Don't have a bunch of ands there, and, 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 and. Uh, try to get a feel of the text and the flow and an understanding of that flow and how you should translate it. Don't depend overly much on then. Some of you said, oh, I, I know it's sequential, so every time you had it, you translate then. Then, 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 then. Well, that's the same as and, 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 and. All right, it doesn't make a good translation. It's translationally insensitive. And it ignores the context and ignores places where it'd be better to say so. She saw the fruit was good, so as a result of that, she took and she ate, you see rather than to say then. Question. Not all the time. Mix it up. You have to mix it up. And when you do leave it out, make certain you, there's a very good reason to leave it out. Uh, usually at the beginning of a section where it's not, where the tie to the prior is not clear or something of that nature. Uh, you can keep it as and when you have too many verbs too close together. You don't have to always translate it as something other than and. And then there's those cases, some of you were very good at this in verse 6 of chapter 3. You began with when the woman saw that the fruit was good. You see, then when you get down to uh, the next Wayik Tol, uh, you've already set it in stage and you're not going to say and because you don't have to translate the next Wayik Tol because it's when. You've already set the time frame. When she did this, she ate. When she saw it, she took and she ate. And so those type of things can work very well. Also keep in mind that some conditional sentences begin with a wow. And uh, watch out for that as well. Okay? Yes, Joe. I, know, I realize it's only a first course, but for those who are going further with the good professor, um, no disrespect to was it Dr. Murphy? Right. Yeah. Um, never translated regularly as now. It sounds like he was saying, this is a key point as an outsider, just so you can trust him on this one. Um, <laughs> I noticed the qualification. Right, right. I don't even hear the and when I read it. Hearing and in the English, I know you're emphasizing it, but just so you understand, I don't hear it most of the time. So if you were continually writing and, it's even more strange. There's a function to it, but it's often not heard. It's just there. It's like if you're a musician, when you're first studying, you, you're focusing on every note. But the master musician, it's, it's a flow. So they're all there as pointers, but, but you eventually lose a lot of the, the, the structures or the forms so that you can just hear the flow of the music. It's just to, to give you on this case. This is the one time I'll agree with you. Okay. <laughs> And you have to come back again to find out when he agrees with me again. <laughs> All right? Yes. <laughs> All right? So keep that in mind. I mean, we, when we're talking about translation, we're talking about what do people hear? 
Remember I emphasize public reading. And we can't be, you, if you're overly literal, we're going to miss things. If we're overly dynamic, we're going to miss things. There's a balance that you've got to reach in there on translation. All right, let's move on to our textbook by uh, Robert Chisholm. And by the way, keep in mind, I just uh, corrected a doctoral dissertation this morning that had his name misspelled. Uh, and uh, Bob's a very kind gentleman, but if you keep misspelling his name, he kind of uh, becomes uncalm. All right, there's two H's in his name. There's an H after the S in his name, and that's the one that's often left out, unfortunately. So make certain whenever you spell it, you put that H in there. Uh, when he's evaluating BDB on page 14, notice what he says about BDB. BDB is Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Now, you may have that on your shelf. It may have been given to you by your father, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a grandfather. You may have found it cheap somewhere. It may be the only Hebrew lexicon that you could afford at the time. It dates back to 1907. It is now 104 years old. You need to realize that it is grossly outdated. It has many inaccurate treatments of Semitic cognates. When it talks about Arabic, when it talks about Aramaic, when it talks about Akkadian or Assyrian or Babylonian, it is often inaccurate because it was produced at a point in time where those particular studies were not fully developed as they are today. It was prior to the finding of the finds at Ugarit. And so Ugaritic isn't even mentioned and it is even closer to Hebrew than those other languages in its relationship. And so there's many things missing from that volume. They have archaic English glosses. A gloss is a translation, a meaning. And uh, some of those are very old. And uh, you look at them and you might even mistake the meaning because they're no longer, that English word is no longer used that way in our English language. Keep in mind also that uh, much of this was prepared in England and so you don't have an American vocabulary either. Also they fail to recognize homonymic roots. You can have four or five different roots of a single spelling that are all seemingly identical, they sound the same, but they have totally different word histories, etymologies, and they have totally different meanings and usages. In BDB, they're all put together in one entry without distinguishing the different roots. The newer lexicons, like Kohler and Baumgartner that we prefer you use, a Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, do distinguish those in market. They'll give a Roman numeral, They'll, they'll say uh, Asa Roman numeral 1, Asa Roman numeral 2, Asa Roman numeral 3. And those are related to three different identifiable roots. They sound the same, so they're homonyms, but they do not mean the same and often do not even have the same history of their formation and their derivation. Uh, their, their bibliographic references in BDB are also outdated. I mean, they're, they're mainly works that were published at the end of the 1800s. And so if you go to try to find out something from one of their sources, you might not even find it. It might not be any longer available. Uh, they arranged it by root derivation. So if you don't know the root, if you have a noun like makom or a noun like tikwa uh, in our Kohler and Baumgartner lexicon, you look up tikwa under the tau. You look up Makom under a Mame. But in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, you've got to look them both up under a Kof. Because the root word for Makom is Kum, and the root word for Tikwa is Kawa. Therefore, you have to watch that. And now there's a recent edition of BDB that has been put out, a reprint edition, where an editor has stepped in and given references to those words. You can see the word there in the most recent edition of BDB. You can see the word there like Makom and it'll tell you go to Kum. But it doesn't rearrange it. It just puts the note in there. It makes it more helpful to use. But keep in mind, and this is part of the reason why we don't use BDB in here and why we require you to have the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament by Kohler and Baumgartner. There's one more reason. And that is that uh, Brown, Driver, and Briggs approached the text in such a way 
that they believed that, for example, Moses did not write hardly any of the Pentateuch. And they will also say that there are at least four different writers, J, E, D, and P. And they will actually classify and put in the lexicon the J, E, D, and P right next to the words and the references to indicate their opinion. We do not hold to that documentary hypothesis here at the seminary. It is a uh, theory that is destructive to the unity of the, of the Hebrew Bible, to the unity of the Pentateuch. We reject it completely. It is not a viable option. And some of their conclusions they reach in that is if it was in the, what they term P writer, then they'll give it a meaning that was found in the 4th century, 5th century B.C., They'll say, even though this is found in Genesis 1, you have to give it the meaning from Ezekiel or from Malachi. Because that's the period of time of the editor or composer for Genesis 1 as a priestly writer according to that theory. That is disruptive. It's destructive of the text. It's a perversion of the text. And so why should we use a tool that treats the text in that fashion? So we don't. We don't use it. Now, when you're employing Kohler and Baumgartner, the one that we do recommend to you, and don't get the idea that uh, Kohler and Baumgartner are perfect. Uh, when you're looking at lexicons, you have to remember that they're really not much different than commentaries. Because the editors give their opinion of how words should be translated in a certain context. And their opinion might include some areas of doctrinal opinion or even interpretive opinion with which we might strongly disagree. Now, do you have the freedom then to question the meaning that they've given? Yes, you have the freedom, but you can question all you want. But where is your evidence? If you're going to provide a different meaning, where's your evidence? What is in the context? What is it that drives you to a different meaning than what the lexicon gives? And there are situations where it is a good thing to disagree with Kohler and Baumgartner or to disagree with Holiday because of a badly chosen translation that was done either ignoring the context or having a preconceived notion of that context that led them to that. Let's take an example. Barak in the Nifal in Genesis 12:3, with the meaning wish on oneself a blessing. Many of the liberal commentators say that this is the meaning. That uh, th this is not a blessing of the descendants of Abraham upon the people of the world, upon all people, but rather that people seeing Abraham wish a blessing on themselves. Now, that really brings into question God's promise to Abraham and what he's saying. And I provided for you in the syllabus a full discussion about three or four type single space pages on this issue and this problem. And why is the Nifal used here as opposed to the Hithpael? You're required to read that and it is quizzable. And there will be at least one question on it on the final exam. So make certain you read that and that you understand the argument I present there and how I, how I bring it about. But this is an example of where they might say, wish on oneself a blessing, but when we go and read the Abrahamic covenant and the blessing of God upon Abraham there in Genesis chapter 12, it appears that it's much better to take it and in the parallel accounts where it is repeated in chapter 17 and chapter 22, it appears it's far better to say that they are blessed they are the passive recipients of that blessing from Abraham. It's not that they look at Abraham and say, oh, bless me. <laughs> it's rather the blessing is not theirs. They did not give it to themselves. The blessing is God's to give, and he chooses to give it through Abraham's seed. That's what needs to be looked at and focused on. So be willing to question these things when you see a translation like this in a lexicon. Uh, look at pages 67 to 72 of the syllabus where this is fully discussed. I won't go into detail here. You can read it for yourself. Um, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading it to you. But do read it. And one comment left here on, on uh, Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament as a tool. 
If you have a computer a laptop, you'd like to have this where it's accessible electronically, easily used. It's a digital copy of this is available on CD from Brill, and it's also available in uh, Libronics packages from Lagos. I use it on my computer, and it's, it's fantastic to have it available to use electronically to, to take around with me everywhere I go. Other tools. When we're translating, when you're studying the words in Hebrew, uh, Klein's uh, Dictionary of, Classical Hebrew, of Classic Hebrew is a, a superb set of volumes. It's not complete yet. There's still a couple of volumes to go. They're in the library. They're in the reference section. And you'll find it very illuminating because he has a different approach. His lexicography is a different approach entirely. He gives the scope of the history of the word from biblical times all the way up through the Mishnaic Hebrew. And it is, is just a fascinating journey of looking at the variations in the words and their meanings through time. And then the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, uh, edited by uh, Botterweck and Ringren. It's now 16 volumes. I believe the 16th volume is an index volume. It's finished now. It was originally published in German and has been translated into English and is the largest work on the words of the Old Testament in Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible's words. Uh, I would highly recommend that you learn how to use this. It's so expensive, I'm not recommending you buy it unless you're going to spend the rest of your life teaching Hebrew. But it has a lot of things in it, it a massive work. For example, the Hebrew word af for anger. Uh, there are at least 18 different synonyms, different nouns for anger in the Hebrew Bible. What are the differences between them? In the article on Af, in volume one, I think it is, might be volume two, uh, there is a full listing of all of the synonyms and a paragraph on each one of them explaining how they differ from one another. That's very helpful. Very, very helpful to have. Then there's the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. This is a more evangelical approach to the text and uh, I reviewed it in the uh, journal back in 1998. You can go back to that journal and take a look at it and look at the review. Dr. Grisanti has 25 uh, entries in this uh, dictionary. Uh, he participated in it and during that time uh, there, he had I think seven or eight that were assigned to him. He did those and then another writer uh, failed to finish his work and so they asked him if he would do their work or put it together and so there are many articles or entries where it has his name plus someone else's name like one of them is Eugene Carpenter and so when you see that uh, don't accuse Dr. Grisanti of holding to the view that's in the entry until you go and talk to him and say is this yours or is this Carpenter's or whoever be fair watch that because there are times when there are things in those articles that he has that have his name on it that he doesn't hold to the view that expre is expressed in it. And that's a good reminder to all of us. When you read a multi-authored entry in any dictionary or encyclopedia, be careful who you blame for what. And the best thing to do is get hold of the authors themselves and ask them directly, is this exactly what you believe or is this what the other guy believed? Check it out carefully. When we're talking about haya and its use in the perfect as a static stative, a state of, be of being, and in the imperfect as a dynamic stative, a state of becoming, Dr. Rasanti in his article on haya in Nidot discusses that haya can have in the perfect a dynamic stative, uh, state of becoming, meaning if it is followed by a Lamed preposition. Pay attention to that. You see there are forms, there are changes that you need to watch out for and remember. And these can be a help. What's the best Hebrew concordance? The best Hebrew concordance is Evan Shoshin. Uh, Chisholm says that in his textbook that we have here. I agree with that. I think Dr. Grisanti agrees with that. There are several lexicons available, but this one is the very best. It lists every single occurrence of every single form they're arranged by form, they're arranged in order, they're numbered, there are definitions given at the beginning, and uh, it's a very easy volume to use that way. Uh, it, there is an older edition where the 
Bible book references are, and the chapter references are in Hebrew. Only the verse number is an Arabic number. So you also get to exercise your Hebrew if you have the older one. And if you don't, then uh, you have a more recent one. It's translated for you. It's an excellent. Remember, it's a hyphenated name. E-V-E-N hyphen. Shoshan. Notice the name, how it's spelled. It's not Evan, E-V-A-N. Okay? It's Evan in the sense of the Hebrew meaning stone. Aleph, Beth, Nun. All right? So Evan, Shoshan. Shoshan, word that can mean a lily. You say, how do you get a name like stone lily? I don't know. But uh, it's a memorable one. And it is a superb concordance. Use it. Learn to use it. Uh, Gibson is one of uh, the uh, works on grammar recently that is available that you could refer to. Uh, Gazinius Couch Cowley, the old volume from 1910 that uh, is the only, still the only exhaustive reference grammar for biblical Hebrew in the English language. And it is translated from Hebrew, so it wasn't originally done in English. Way outdated, but nothing has replaced it. The Introduction to Biblical Hebrew Syntax by Bruce Waltke and Michael O'Connor is a large volume, and they will tell you right up front it's not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive reference grammar. They left out some things. There was more to be done. There could be a second volume done. But as Dr. Waltke explained to me, he was not ever go again going to be involved in this project. He's through. He's had his time in writing a book like that. He says, I'm too old to do anything like that again. And... Uh, the relationship between him and O'Connor was pretty strained by the time they finished the project. And so he wasn't going to go on in that uh, vein. But uh, it's left to you. I'm not going to do it. I don't, I don't want to have time with the things I have, the projects I have, to write a new uh, uh, intense, uh, extensive, advanced, or intermediate Hebrew grammar. Perhaps someone from here will uh, get enough training that you will find this calling in your life to write that extensive, exhaustive reference grammar for Biblical Hebrew in the English language for the first time. Because none's been done. None has ever been written in, in the English language. All of them that have been done before are written in German. That's why in our doctoral program we require German. Every Old Testament major has to have German. And in fact we require it, just to, for good measure, required of New Testament majors and theology majors too. And Juan Maroka, originally written in French by Paul Juan, translated by a Japanese man, Takamitsu Moraoka, uh, translated it into English for us, an excellent grammar of uh, Hebrew that uh, goes beyond the basics and is a good reference grammar. Uh, fairly up to date because Moroka has, uh, the most recent update is 2006 on that one. Bible software. Everyone asks about this. What's the best Bible software to have on my computer? Well, I agree with Bob Chisholm, and recently we had the Accordance people on campus present, making a presentation to the faculty on Accordance. And Dr. Mayhew, who is not impressed by most Bible programs, uh, was very impressed with Accordance. He said it was the first time he'd ever seen something work faster than he can work with his books. And uh, he said it was instantaneous. It was there. Uh, it's very intuitive program. It is a very user-friendly program. It is intensely powerful to use. It's, it's, it's deceptive in its simplicity because it is so powerful. And uh, the Accordance 9 is available on the Mac. You can have an emulator on a PC and operate it as well. The PC editions have never flown. It's never worked out. The PC conversions to try to do it on the PC and have its own program, they've worked on that for years and years. For years I talked with the men that were involved in the project, Paul Miller and others, and it, everyone just ran into uh, frustration of trying to get done because the Mac system is just so superior for this type of tool, this type of product. You just can't avoid it. Now, I used to have Accordance on my computer at home, my Mac. I have a Mac laptop, an iMac. And after uh, version number two, I had number one, I had Accordance number two. After that, when they changed to Accordance three, they boosted the price about double, and I said, I can't afford it. And I've never put it back on. They're trying to convince me now to put it back on again, now that they got to Accordance nine. 
and uh, that we might get a package deal here at the seminary to bring the price down. I just might do it because of that. But it is the best, gentlemen. And now I work for Lagos, all right? And I love Bible works. But accordance, in spite of all the good the other two have, accordance is the best Bible software package bar none. Yes, sir. Yes, it's ease of use. It's intuitive. It's easy to use. It's powerful. Uh, they have all kinds of tools that are accessible. Uh, if you're a New Testament, they have the ancient manuscripts instantly accessible to where you can check what does Alexandrinus have, what does Vaticanus have, what does Sinaiticus have. You can see it for yourself. They haven't yet developed that for the Old Testament side, for the Hebrew Bible yet, but they will. It'll be available in the near future. And uh, those things are very exciting about it. The other programs, Bible Works and uh, Lagos, when you do your, your searches for a technical grammatical element, you have to open up a separate tool. You have to go into a huge menu. You have to click off box here, box here, box here. You get all the way through it and you click on it to search and it comes up with nothing because you have one thing wrong in it. Or... You didn't understand that if you click this, that eliminates this, et cetera, et cetera. It's so complicated. They make it super complicated. So you, you feel like you're fill, filling out your income tax form every time you do a search. In accordance, you know what you want? I want a cal perfect first common singular followed by a lamed preposition that is attached to a masculine noun singular. You just type it in almost exactly like that and it comes up. You don't have to go through and fill out a huge form to get it. You just start typing and it's all abbreviated. You put your abbreviations in, type it up, boom. It's there. It's easy. It's intuitive. It's powerful. You can put any qualification on it you want. And there's little brackets and things you can use to do certain qualifications, to eliminate this, to add this, to include this. It's, it's amazing. It is just a superb search engine. If you ever use it, you'll never want to use anything else because it's that great. Yes? Somebody say that's for Bible software, though, but it's not as powerful as a library, commentaries, and resources. Right, that's the downside, and I'm coming to that next. <laughs> All right. Yes, Lagos 4 available on Libronics. Great tool. It has search facilities available. Not as intuitive as Accordance. The advantage of Lagos is you've got a whole library. On this laptop, I have over 3,000 volumes with Lagos. I've got lexicons, I've got all kinds of translations, I've got commentaries, I've got, I've got a full library right here in this laptop I can carry with me. And now that I have an iPhone, I take out my iPhone, I can put whatever tools I want onto that iPhone to carry with me if that's all I can take on a trip or being somewhere and I have those tools available there as well. It is amazing because of all it can do in that regard. and. Your sermons, your messages, you can format through a personal publisher and add to your library, and it's fully searchable. When you do a search, it'll search through your, your material as well that you've added to your library. So that when you're preparing something, it doesn't matter what you're looking at, you can search through everything. All the periodical articles, everything. You do a search, it'll come back telling you where all this is found in all 3,000 volumes. It's very powerful. Bible Works is also very good. Yes? discussion over there about them catching up with Accordance? And oh yes. These three, Accordance, Lagos, and Bible Works are in competition. Fierce competition. It's a healthy competition. It's good for you and for me. Because if they're competing with each other to constantly be the best, they're learning from each other. When one guy gets ahead of the other, they say, I've got to catch up. And so they're constantly improving. And that is very good. Because it means that we've got competition going. It's not going to stagnate. It, it, it allows it to keep developing to where it gets easier and easier to use. Uh, Lagos 4 sometimes has problems. Like right now, I have an issue. I was on, on the phone for two hours yesterday talking to support. They couldn't resolve it. I knew they wouldn't be able to resolve it because I'd gone to all the forums. I've done everything to try to resolve it. Couldn't resolve it. And then when it finally fell through, they said, call a uh, technician today. We'll have a case number. You can call and see if he can figure this out. Sometimes in the Lagos system, things aren't working quite right and glitches can occur and they can be very frustrating. On Bible Works, 
uh, Bible works is now a uh, nine is about ready to be released I hear eight is out now nine will soon be coming and uh, Bible works is got excellent search facilities uh, excellent parallel columns for working with the text they have a large number of tools available they just don't have the volume of tools that you have in Lagos even accordance can't match the volume of tools that Lagos has and accordance tends to be more expensive for whatever you get from them anyway but uh, that's because Apple computers are also more expensive too. Uh, Bible Works, uh, I, I, I use both Logos and Bible Works simultaneously on my computer. I like using them both. They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses. I play them against each other. You very quickly find that when you're doing this, you better confirm every statistic. Because the, the statistics you get on back on your searches and everything else will not always be accurate. You can find Bible work search for the identical search that you do on Logos will come up with a different result. And the same on Accordance. Why? Computers are this, simple. Garbage in, garbage out. If you have someone make a mistake, that's what's there. In the early days of the Westminster tagging of the text at Westminster Seminary, when they were inputting the text, the typists were not consistent in when they put input the vowel pointings and the accents. If it's not in a consistent, systematic order in every single case, your searches will not turn up the same patterns. They'll turn up a different pattern. And you'll see obvious references missing completely. Always confirm statistics. Don't trust the parsings. You have a little parsing indicator there. You just wave your cursor over it and it comes with a parsing. Beware. Beware. About one out of every 30 parsings has a problem. Heavy duty. Think about that. Don't make your grade depend upon the use of your computer parsing system. Glosses are mostly inaccurate. Why? Because all they can do is give you one word. They can give you one word to represent that Hebrew word. And they've tried to key it to where it's not overly complicated so they might give you always holy for Kadash when uh, there are times when it doesn't mean holy. I mean Kidesh, the Piel can also mean that which is anti-holy, unholy. The same as Chata Sin in the PL can mean to de-sin, to purify. There are the opposites. Barak, uh, when you have Barak in the PL, it can mean to bless, but it can also mean curse. Look at Job in chapter 1. So when you're going there, the, the gloss they give you is one. And it's going to be mostly wrong when it gives you that gloss. So don't depend upon the glosses. Learn to use your Bible software wisely and with care. Don't become overly dependent on it. And uh, beware that it does have problems. It does have problems. Just briefly, because I don't want to go into great detail uh, because this is being recorded on DVD, but uh, Joe and his wife Sarah uh, she is a reformed rabbi who is a Air Force chaplain and uh, he is a lay Orthodox rabbi. Uh, we first met them about five and a half years ago. She was at Hebrew Union College studying for the rabbinate and Joe was very unhappy with the Hebrew that she was learning there. Very dissatisfied. So he began a search to try to find good Hebrew materials. And in his search he ended up at Grace Book Shack down here found the Beric Busnitz grammar, bought it, took it home, and phoned Dr. Busnitz and said, I've got to meet you guys. This is the Hebrew I want my wife to learn. And that began a relationship. We went to lunches together. We've had our families together. We were visited Joe when his father passed away. Uh, we've been witnessing to them now for all these years. He's coming slowly, slowly, slowly. And he's got right now the big hang up right now is salvation by works. We're trying to get past that. So be praying for him. Uh, we believe sincerely God can save this man. 
We believe his wife can be saved. We can believe that these people can be redeemed and be of great service to God. They're great people, great uh, awareness of other people, great sensitivity. Uh, Joe loves the Hebrew Bible. He attends my song classes, my Genesis classes. He'll be in the Genesis class Tuesday, he said. He's been in them in the past. Uh, I, I, uh, lots of stories to tell you about, lots of things. But uh, he's hungry for the word. And uh, it just it thrills him to come and to sit in the classes. He's, uh, it helps a lot that he believes that the Hebrew ought to be taught the way Dr. Buzditz and I teach it. Uh, it helps a lot that he agrees with our pronunciations and the way we handle things. It helps a lot that uh, we believe that uh, Moses wrote the Pentateuch and he does too. It helps a lot that we have the stand we do and the awareness we do of things. And uh, we've got an open door. And we just pray that God will lead this man and his wife to Christ. I have to ask, since, since uh, some of us came from Dr. Business class, right. and then um, I was at a an event this weekend where uh, I assume he was Orthodox Jew. He came and did an invocation mm -hmm. and he read a song, Hebrew and then English, but he did not say Yahweh. So can you explain for, for, for us what's the big deal about that and what did Joe okay, say about we will, it? We will get to that later because it is a topic that we will discuss. It's part of your syllabus as well. And I have a point in the presentations where I'll come to that. Okay, so I will come back to that. It's an important point and a good question. All right, and we have a time for it. Okay, other questions? All right, let's move on then. This is the Bible software section on pages 17 to 18. Then let's talk about exegetically significant grammar. On page 57, Chisholm says, if we seem to devote more space, relatively speaking, to the non-standard phenomena, it is because they are usually more problematic to the student of Hebrew grammar and often more rhetorically and exegetically significant than routine standard uses and constructions. This book does not cover every element of Hebrew grammar and syntax. You will find many things missing. You'll find many things abbreviated with very brief statements and recognition. The purpose of this textbook is for a review and it's a review that focuses on the exegetically significant elements of Hebrew grammar which is what we focus on within this course as well. In your syllabus, there are a list of 12 of those exegetically significant grammatical elements. Let's talk about some of them in the order that Chisholm talks about them. He has a section on nouns. If you turn there on page 59, he talks about the noun Elohim. He talks about it being grammatically plural when it refers to the God of Israel, it is a plural of respect. The plural of respect is sometimes used idiomatically for individual pagan deities as well. And he says, when the plural is one of respect, then it is improper to argue, as many have done, that the form hints at a plurality of persons within the Godhead, and thus foreshadows in some cryptic way the doctrine of the Trinity. I, we agree with him 100%. Elohim does not prove Trinity. Elohim is not a reference to Trinity. If you take Elohim as a reference to Trinity, what will you do then when you find the Canaanite god Baal referred to with the word Elohim? Is he also a Trinity? And what about the Canaanite goddess Ashtoreth, who is also called in the Bible Elohim? Is she a Trinity? You see this is not talking about the Trinity. You can tell that because every adjective describing Elohim when it's talking about God is singular, not plural. Every verb used with Elohim when you're talking about the true God is a singular verb, not a plural. This noun has nothing to do with the Trinity. Okay? Try to remember that and keep it in mind. So how do we demonstrate a trinity? Well, it's very simple. Genesis 1-2, you have the Spirit of God referred to. Genesis chapter 19, you have two Yahwehs referred to. Also in Genesis chapter 1, we have God using the plural pronoun we. And it's very interesting 
that the plural pronoun and plural reference is not honorific, is not a plural of respect. In fact, Juan Muraoka in section 114, paragraph E, say that the we is never a plural of respect in the Hebrew Bible. So there you have clear indications. They also discuss it again in section 136. So both in section 114 and section 136, Juan Muraoka discussed this very aspect that the plurality of the Godhead is shown in those plural pronouns and those plural references and verbs, not in the plural form of the noun Elohim. We would also urge that the context and the references to Yahweh, to the spirit of Yahweh, to the arm of Yahweh, to the messenger of Yahweh, all of these are used to argue for a trinity more strongly than depend upon the plural form of Elohim. Isaiah chapter 60 very clearly speaks of three different persons of the Godhead. And there are other passages like that where you can see distinct persons of the Godhead. Where you have one person sent by another. When you have one person chosen by another. When you have one person cared for by another. When you have one person empowered by another. Just like in the Gospels when the Spirit empowers Christ in his ministry. But as we look at this, we reach the section here that you will be translating. In fact, you have translated, Lord willing. I think I saw 29 of them already posted before I walked in here. Before I walked over to chapel, I went over to chapel earlier, early, so hopefully the other four of you got yours in soon after that. And Genesis 3, 8 through 16, you've translated Genesis 3, 15. How did you translate it? Did you follow Chisholm? He says here on page 59 that, uh, excuse me, uh, he's talking about the proponents of the, of the Messianic interpretation should not argue their case from the presence of the singular noun Zerah, seed or offspring, because this noun, while sometimes referring to an individual descendant, frequently refers to one's offspring or descendants in the collective sense. Did you translate the plural in 315? Think about it. Was it a plural or was it a singular? We have to look at the context. And by the way, before I forget it here, I think we come back to, to, to 3 5 later with regard to Elohim. But skipping ahead here from Elohim into this section is because this is what he mentions next right after he talks about Elohim. Later he comes back to Genesis 3 5, so it's a little bit out of the order in the way we're talking about it here. But as you read that text, uh, and I will place enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall wound your head but you shall wound his heel and actually as you're translating this if I can walk over here and use my pointer and point this out notice some things about this this is the word for enmity it is a noun it precedes you have a while conjunction. This is a disjunctive clause. So this is either going to be giving us additional information, background information, or it is going to be giving us the uh, idea of an adversative. So, but I will place, ashith uh, is the middle vowel verb, uh, hirikyod in the middle, to place. This is a cal, imperfect, first common singular. You say, but that has an A-class vowel. Why isn't that a causative stem? It has a hirikyod. Why isn't that a causative stem? It's because of the characteristics of a middle vowel verb that you have the change in the vowel pointings. Between you, the Hebrew uses two betweens. In English, we don't use two betweens. So just translate the between once. Notice here, the woman. Let's stop and ask a question. Who is the woman? Eve. She's the only woman there, even though some of you translated it women in the garden with Adam. There's only one woman. Just don't let your wives know you translate that in a plural, all right? The woman, the identification is specific and individual. It's not referring to women. It's not referring to humankind. The woman, the previously mentioned woman in the context and between your seed second masculine singular not second masculine plural not third masculine plural not their seed 
your seed. What is the antecedent of the second masculine singular here? The serpent to whom God is speaking. All right? Your seed and her seed. Third feminine singular pronominal suffix. You know it's a third feminine singular pronominal suffix because you have a mapik in the hay. Identifies it as a suffix. What's the antecedent? The woman. It's not generic. It's not general. It's not collective. These are specific. The who, the personal pronoun. Third masculine singular. What's the antecedent? The seed. Now because your prior pronominal suffixes are referring to specific individuals, would you expect this to be collective? Or would you expect it to be singular? You would expect it to be singular first before you ever thought to take it as collective. He shall bruise you, masculine singular, and then this is an adverbial accusative. Literally, it's with reference to the head. But it's to bruise you. Notice that it's very specific. The same you that's here. The same you that's here. The one to whom God is speaking. But you, personal pronoun, notice this is an emphatic personal pronoun, he himself, because this is third masculine singular here, doesn't have to have a subject specified. It is, so it's emphatic. This one, is it emphatic? Well, it might be emphatic, but because it is used here to cause the disjunctive, to give the antithetical idea, you better be careful about making this emphatic. It's, but you shall wound him. Third masculine singular, pronominal suffix, has to refer to who? Which has to refer to the seed, her seed, with reference to the heel. Yes, sir. Um, when you first translated that, you said his head. And then right. you just got yes. through that, you said his, his Yeah, with his reference to the head. Right, what, what correct. What's your preference? With reference to the head. Notice where the second masculine singular pronominal suffix is. Yeah, we're, I'm used to quoting that because that's what the English versions have, you know, as you're looking at it. But technically, this is an accusative pronominal suffix. Here and here. So about him on the head or... On the head, head with reference to the head, yes. This is an adverbial accusative, both of these. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. In terms of the importance of wording it that way, could it... Is it right to interpret it as saying that this phrase is setting up specifically the, the enmity between the two of them? Like, it's worded in such a way where it's, it's him versus you, specifically. Yes, it is specifically labeled that way, exactly. That's exactly what you would read this naturally. Now, as you read the totality of Scripture, you understand that there is uh, an enmity between all individuals empowered by Satan, not just that one snake, and the people of God. So even in the New Testament, you'll have a usage that is broader than even what you would expect here. And there is a theme in Genesis you have to be aware of, of seed as well. And that seed as a theme is both collective and singular. Okay? Yes, sir. So the seed of the serpent, uh, how do we understand, do we understand that to be the followers or what, what, what do okay, we that? I'll explain that next. Good question. Isn't that the natural question to have? has to be. If we're going to say that the seed here of the woman is Messiah, then who is the singular seed of the serpent? Okay, let's take a look at that. First of all, let's talk about first century Roman crucifixion. All right? There have been three first century Roman crucifixions excavated with the finds in Israel that have demonstrated what method was used in crucifixion. Notice on this picture that the wrist is where the nail is placed. Why is that? If you put the nail between the phalanges of the hand, it's just ten tendons and skin here that can be ripped out. And if you're in excruciating pain anyway and you don't want to die, you're willing to tear your hand up just to get down and get away from there. Romans realized that. They tested these methods. They were brutal in their testing of these methods. They found that if you put the nail here between the radius and the ulna 
and right there beside the wrist that you could not pull it out so easily and if you put a piece of wood over it first you couldn't push it out either. Now you say, but wait a minute. If the crucifixion is marks in the hands, the stigmata that Roman Catholics talk about here, that's false. It's here. You say, but that's not the hand, that's the wrist. In Hebrew, Yod refers to everything from the wrist up. In fact, Yod can refer to the entire arm. So there's no contradiction there whatsoever. And even in the Greek, the word for, for hand, which I think is kaira, can involve the wrist as well. So there's no problem there. And then look at the feet. Notice where the nail is placed? Through the side of the foot, below the ankle bone, next to the heel bone. Again, you put it between the toes and the phalanges of the foot, and the same thing can be done. You can rip it out. They found out there's a place that's surrounded by bone, but you can get a nail through there, and you put a piece of wood where they can't pull it out sideways. They're, they're not going to do it very well sideways anyway. And if you've been in sports, you know there's where the injuries take place when you have sideways movement. That's when you blow a knee or you pull a groin muscle or whatever. And that's not going to come out very easily. You put it in there. Think back again. Genesis 3.15. What does it say? Wound you, you shall wound him with regard to the heel. Okay, now let's go back to the other wound him with regard to the head, except we have one more thing here to show you. These are uh, drawings of some of those finds that show the wound very clearly right here next to the heel bone. The bones have been recovered from these sites and it's very clear metal has pierced there. That's how they were crucified and they could check that out with the bone fragments that were there. It becomes very plain, very clear. It's very detailed and specific and fulfilled very specifically. Uh, before I go further, the head, the head wound of the seed of the serpent. Where do we read anywhere in scripture about a head wound of anyone empowered by Satan? The Antichrist, the beast out of the sea, Revelation chapter 13. He has a mortal head wound. That is what we're talking about. You see, you have, when we're looking at these details in the Old Testament, they are in great detail. And they are accurate. Fully and completely accurate. Just as Satan empowered the serpent in the temptation of the garden, Satan is going to be the power behind the man of sin, the Antichrist, in the end time. And his seed is going to be the one that will be wounded in the head. Now let's go further. Let's talk about page 61 and the noun cases in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew. Uh, there are three case functions basically in Hebrew. The nominative, the genitive, and the accusative. In ancient Hebrew, the nominative was normally identified by a shurik at the end of a noun. We see that in names like Bethuel, the house which is God, or a house which is God. Penuel, the face which is God. You have uh, apposition being used here to, to define something, the, the divine face, the divine house. And so the U class is the ending that was normally found on ancient Hebrew nouns that were nominative. That has basically almost entirely disappeared except in some very old noun forms in names. The genitive was originally a hiric yod type of ending, an E function. That shows up very interestingly when you have the oldest forms of nouns available in the language, which are nouns of relationship, like father, and brother. How do you say your father? Your father is avika. Why the e in there? Where did that come from? It's the old genitive that's preserved. The old genitive that is preserved. Same thing with your brother. It's ahika. You have the hirikyod show up. And you can look at that and say, but 
It's not plural. It's singular. By context, it's singular. Why is the yod in there? Why is the hyric yod in there? It's the old genitive. Preserved, fossilized in that ancient form. The accusative. The accusative has thought, been thought by many to be a comet's hay at the end of a word. Like we have the, what we call the hay directive or hay locative has often been treated as the accusative. And there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, the linguists now, according to Walt, Walt Ken O'Connor, are beginning to doubt that that is really accusative. That it's really more of something like a locative or even a dative form rather than an accusative. So that's still being worked on and debated, but there are those old noun endings, A class, I class, and U class that were found on the ancient Hebrew words. And so those three cases are very uh, evident as you're looking at the Hebrew nouns. The nominative absolute, how many of you have had Greek thus far? All right, how many of you remember studying in Greek anything about a genitive absolute or an ablative absolute, any of you? Okay, good. It's the same terminology. When we say it's absolute, it means if you remove it from the sentence, the sentence still makes perfect sense. The sentence is still complete grammatically. You've just removed an element that is emphatic. That's all it is. The nominative absolute in Hebrew is the same way. When we look at Genesis 3.12, which you've translated, Ha'isha esher natata imadi The woman whom you gave to be with me. He not nali min ha'etz wa okel. She gave to me from the tree, so I ate. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's, let me come over here again. Notice, first of all, ha'isha can be dropped off here completely, and it still makes sense because the statement is she gave. And notice she gave, this is a calperfect third feminine singular. She gave me from the tree, so I ate, is what's being said. Why do we have ha'isha up here all alone as a nominative absolute? It's emphatic. And because it's emphatic, this hey article here, definite article, is probably behave, behaving like a demonstrative pronoun. That woman. And in case God doesn't get the picture, Adam goes, now think about this. This is a lot of gall, right? This is not Adam's greatest moment. Some people say, when did Adam fall? Well, obviously he fell before this. Look at his speech. Impatience. Uh, disrespect for God. Passing the blame. All these things going on here. That woman whom you gave to be with me. Blames God for it. Hey, I, I didn't ask for her. You gave her to me, right? She, emphatic personal pronouns, she herself gave to me from the tree, so I ate. Why all of this nominative absolute construction with a triple reference to the woman? Because Adam is pretty well exercised here. Wrongly so. And he's being very emphatic and very disrespectful of God. And he's certainly not protecting his wife as God would have him protect her. He's showing that he's a fallen being. He's proving it by the way he's talking. That nominative absolute is his way of being emphatic in the speech. Okay? Question? Yes. They're found, this is found in both uh, the uh, Cal imperfect uh, first common singular because the pay olive verb, uh, initial olive, one olive verb. And uh, it does take some different forms, right? And you have to, this is where, I, when we, the first thing we talked about, remember the rules, the gutturals? Gutturals will assimilate. So the olive of the prefix and the olive of the root letter, the root there has, they have merged. And it has created a change in the vowel pattern as well as a result. And so, you, you know, that's part of the explanation. Gutturals are involved. Okay? When gutturals get involved, things become messy. All right? And that's when you start uttering guttural sounds. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Let's move on a little bit further here. 
uh, the directive or locative hey on page 64, number 3. It says he gives here the, the example from Jonah 1 3 that uh, so Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Tarshishah is to Tarshish. This too, by the way, is not to be put in italics because it's here in the text. It's this right here. It's in the text. Just because there's an alamant doesn't mean you put it in italics. The inflection of the noun tells you it's there. The meaning is there. The form is there. The word is there. To Tarshish. It's sometimes a locative, sometimes a directive. Here it's a directive. In page 65, Chisholm says, interpretation sometimes involves correctly identifying the precise case function of a noun. In such situations, grammar alone usually cannot resolve the issue. But awareness of the options can aid one in arriving at a conclusion, as here. Comets, hey ending, what are your options? If it's a noun, look first to see if it's just a feminine singular noun that ends in comets, hey. Check it in the lexicon. But if you find out, as here, that the form is Tarshish, it does not have a comet's hay on it, then you've got to ask the question, is the third feminine singular pronominal suffix? Well, the third feminine singular pronominal suffix is normally distinguished in such a situation by having a mapik, that dot that looks like a dogish in the hay. It's not here, so it's not a pronominal suffix. So it is a noun inflection, therefore is it directive? Or is it locative? Well, translate it and see if it makes sense. To flee in Tarshish or to flee to Tarshish? And you have the answer. The context determines. You flee to somewhere. You don't flee in somewhere. All right? Unless it's a maze or something. And uh, you're trying to get out of it. And the context here doesn't seem to have that. Uh, Adjectives. The predicate adjective on page 67. Uh, Predicate adjectives are very easy to identify because... They do not take a, an article even if they are modifying a noun that is definite. Usually, a predicate adjective is placed first in the sentence. Here we have Yahweh bitzion gadol. Yahweh is great in Zion. Why is gadol put at the end? In order to focus on and emphasize Yahweh. Yahweh. The idea is Yahweh alone. It's Yahweh. Yahweh himself who is great in Zion. There is no other. Or Psalm, uh, the, the second half of this uh, verse in Psalm 99 verse 2, Weram hu. Here we have the normal order. And exalted is he above all the peoples. Here's the normal word order. Predicate adjectives have no definite article. They normally come first in word order. Here, this one has no article. The noun it modifies is definite. Proper names are definite. So if you're going to talk about Yahweh the Great, you have to have Yahweh Hagadol. Because Yahweh is a definite noun. Because it's a proper name. Proper names are definite. And so this Gadol doesn't have it because it's predicate. So you have to supply the copula. You have to supply the is in translation. It's here in the construction so you don't italicize copulas because you have to have it to give the proper meaning. You can't give the proper meaning without it. You can't just say Yahweh and Zion great. Doesn't mean anything. You have to say is great. And he is exalted. Now why was this changed? First of all to focus on Yahweh. Front position in Hebrew sentences is the place of emphasis. Normal word order, verb, subject, object. Normal word order, verb, subject, object. When you have that changed, there's a difference and there's emphasis. And when you have a change in any order, here you have a noun clause without a verb. So you're not looking at the verb. But you see that the predicate adjective that's normally first is last, so that means this is here emphatically. It also opens it up to put Gadol and Ram back to back in the middle of the verse. It's a kind of chiastic arrangement. It ties them together in the, in the middle to not only emphasize that it's Yahweh and Yahweh alone who is great in Zion, but that Yahweh who is great is also exalted. He's great and exalted. So your secondary focus is on the adjectives, on the characteristics that define who Yahweh is. That's exegetically significant, you see. 
And when you're preaching on that, you want to focus on that. What's, what do you focus on here? Don't focus on Zion. Don't focus on all the peoples. Yes, they're there and you need to talk about them, but where's the main majority of your time to be spent? Focused on God and focused on his character of being great and exalted. Your message ought to be about the great and exalted Yahweh, the great and exalted God. That's the core of the message on Psalm 99 verse 2. Not Zion, not all the peoples. There's your focal point. Your grammar helps you drive that when you understand word order and how predicate adjectives are utilized and used. Let's go to the participles. This is the last thing we'll have today and close. This was from the previous translation. This was one I mentioned earlier that we're getting to. We're finally getting back here to Elohim. And this is on pages 68 to 70. And you're going to find out that I disagree with Chisholm. And uh, I will explain why. He says that when we approach this text, Ki Yodea Elohim, because God knows that when, the biome is an idiomatic, look in your lexicons, it means when. It's not in that day, it's not talking about a specific day, there's no article here. When you, plural, eat from it, referring to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then a logical connector here or thus your eyes, this is plural, the diphal perfect, uh, third masculine plural or third common plural, your eyes will be opened. Notice it's niphal passive. It's not you will open your eyes. It's not your eyes will open on their own. Your eyes will be opened. There is an outside external agency that will perform this, that will open the eyes of Adam and Eve. The implication by context is it's God himself will change their hearts, their minds, their understanding in all of this. He will open their eyes, your eyes, and you will be, not become, and you will be like God or gods, knowing good and evil. Why the problem? Here's the issue, the problem. This is a plural, masculine plural construct form of the participle, cal active participle. Notice that seri yod, it's a masculine plural construct ending. This is a plural noun. If yod a refers to Elohim, then this Elohim is not the true God. It is God's with a little g. It has to be. Because if this plural defines this noun, this noun then is taken as a plural, not a singular. Now that's what he holds to. And you look at that and you say, well, there's, there's basis, there's foundation for this. So then he proceeds to offer some argumentation for it. And in his argumentation, he, and he translated it, you will be like godlike beings who know good and evil. And as you look at it, he starts off and he gives a whole series. You can see them there on page 68 and 69. He starts with Genesis 27, 23 is the second one up there. And he goes on through all of these passages. He lists almost a page and a half of passages in which he has gone through and he says all of these are the same. And they demonstrate according to him that he has properly divided the relationships between the words and that the plural participle goes with Elohim. Now let's back up a second here and let's reevaluate this. As we're looking at this, note what we have in Genesis 3.5. We have a zakef katon over Elohim. We have the kaf on Elohim. We have the participle after the disjunctive accent. The next passage from Genesis 27, he looks at that here is your revia for a disjunctive accent. Here is the athnak for disjunctive accent. Here's the kaf, and your participle is way at the end, separated. It is not the same type of situation at all. The context of this is not the same type of context grammatically as what we have in Genesis 3 5. 
You go down here, the same thing. Here's your disjunctive accent. Here's your cough. And here's your participle. Yes, these two are side by side like these two are side by side. But these two have a disjunctive accent between them. The mass reads are indicating by that that traditionally this is read with a pause after that because there's a disjunction in the meaning. The same here. You have the same situation. Here you have the disjunctive accent. Down here, here's the disjunctive accent. Then you have the cough. And then you have the participle here. It is not identical to Genesis 3, 5. And you keep going through all of the examples. There's not any example that matches the situation at all among all those he gave you. So what he's done is he's flooded your minds with this ongoing uh, machine gun fire bunch of data that can overwhelm you and make you think, wow, man, that's impressive. Oh, there's a lot of evidence here to support his interpretation. But when you break it down, you find out there is no evidence because he's not done his exegetical work properly. Number one, he has failed to observe the accents. He does not see the logical disjunctions and conjunctions within the text itself. He has ignored complete contexts. Not just the accents, the complete context. None of these situations fits the situation we have here in Genesis 3.5. Not a single one of them grammatically fits. Doesn't fit exegetically whatsoever. But there's even worse news to come. And this was identified clear back in 1939 by Lewis Berry Chafer when he was dealing with the names of deity. And he pointed out that in Genesis 3.5, if you're going to have this as gods or supernatural beings, where did they get the idea? Hmm? Where would Adam and Eve have such an idea? Genesis 3.5 is before the fall. In their unfallen state, there are no heathen. So there can be no gods. There's no concept of other deities. Because there are none. It took unbelievers to bring that concept into the creation. There's no such thing as gods before the fall. They are non-existent. Compare it with what the passage in scripture that deals with the fall of Satan in Isaiah chapter 14. Some of you say, oh no, that's the king of Babylon. Oh, read it very carefully. Because you'll find out there are results there described of the king of Babylon that cannot apply to the king of Babylon. They must apply to someone else. There are two individuals talked about in Isaiah 14. And there are distinctive phraseologies referring to each of those two that make them distinct and different. And what is the sin of Lucifer, the son of the morning star at that time, he said, I will be like the Most High. What is the serpent doing through the instigation of Satan in this situation in the garden? He's trying to replicate his own sin. It's Satan who said, I want to be like the Most High. And he's the one telling Eve, you will be like God. Trying to get her to make the same sin. I want to be like God. I want to be like God, you see? The context of Scripture as a whole answers this problem very specifically in that way. That's all we're going to get to today. We'll have to come back to this later. But let me just point out something here for your exegetical knowledge. Notice the answer to the problem of Genesis 3.5 is not resting entirely upon a fine point of Hebrew grammar or even a fine point of Masoretic Hebrew accents. It rests upon common sense and the theological understanding of the totality of Scripture. There can be no gods with a little g before the fall. You don't have to know Hebrew to answer this question and to get it right and to translate it correctly. And gentlemen, I know I've got you in here and I'm teaching you Hebrew exegesis. But I don't want to discourage you from taking Hebrew because you need to take it and I want you to take it. I want you to be in here. But 99% of the issues you face exegetically are not answered by either the Hebrew or the Greek. They're answered by a good, contextual, total picture and knowledge of the Word of God. 
And that's why some of those people in your churches who don't even have a high school education but are godly and walk with God and saturate themselves with the word of God sometimes come up with better answers than you do. And you can actually learn from them because they put it all together and they see the picture and you're too busy looking at the bark on the tree. You can't see the forest. Back up and take a look. Your theology is very important. Your study of scripture as a whole is very important. This is all part of an approach. You have to have all of this to do well.